First of all, uh, I would like to thank Rene and also Marietta for this invitation to open this workshop on the concept of schools of the forest. Uh, this invitation has a particular significance to me since it creates uh, opportunity, it has created to me the opportunity to reflect about a lifelong experience with several modalities or experiments in schools of the forest. Not alone, but uh, in, with my wife, Manuela Cardinero da Cunha, who is back there. And these experiments, in fact, are part of a wide array of similar experiences uh, taking place in, in Brazil nowadays, um, and mixing, putting together academics, uh, scientists, and indigenous peoples. I was also intrigued by the idea of Miami campus of the School of the Forest, proposed by Maria uh, And in fact, I noticed that this was a very appropriate idea, considering what the University of the Forest is today. It's not just a physical building. It exists as a campus of the forest. But it's not only that. It's, in fact, a set of decentralized, autonomous campi uh, who do carry autonomous experiences in different scientific disciplines, and humanities and in arts, with a focus on the forest and on its inhabitants, and having at the main general, common guideline, the idea of a possible dialogue, respectful and egalitarian, between academic wisdom and traditional knowledge. That's the central concept. Uh, these experiences can be grouped together under the idea of a university of a forest in the sense of uh, an extended network for teaching, learning, doing research, and uh, exercising the imagination in different ways. Uh, I was also, also intrigued by the idea proposed by Majerchika of centering uh, yeah, the project on a kind, I quote, of elevated open air structure common among Amazonian forest communities, which he encountered in Acre, my state in, in Brazil. And uh, I, I noticed that uh, Marechi, which is a notion of perception of the place was really very appropriate. Uh, This construction, in a sense, can be thought as a metaphor for the very, the very idea of schools of the forest, because they put together materials and ideas collected both from uh, rural areas, rivers, uh, and, and forest places, and from town. This mixing of materials and, and concepts uh, is a good way to express the idea of uh, schools of the forest and in the forest, and conveying also their power of imagination. I am showing you some other examples of this kind of construction with their satellite dishes, and uh, this is interior of one of those, those open air kind of houses. And now uh, I give some 
examples of actual schools working uh, in, in, the, in the forest from the outside and from the inside. And uh, I just visited the school of the forest built in Stalot in this museum. It's, it's, it seems very much like that one, this open air space. This is another example among the Ashanika Indians. This, uh, th these are schools in very different places in the Amazonia. This the, you can see the interior of the Ashanika school. And this, in fact, a school boat. It's the equivalent of a school bus, a school bus in Amazonia. This is the, another interior of a school. And, uh, and this gives you an uh, idea of uh, these kind of the structures, and it's an introduction to my main theme. And uh, the main thing to highlight here is that schools of the forest are not meant as a place for transmitting information from us to indigenous peoples, peasants, riverine populations. The intended sense behind it, this concept is that the forest and its inhabitants, humans and non-humans, are themselves teachers for us. And also the idea that the forest is itself, including its human and non-human population, a source, an infinite source of information, of knowledge, and of beauty. This is the generating idea behind the project of Encyclopedia of the Forest, about which I hope, I expect to talk about tomorrow, and the University of, of the Forest. Okay, now I pass to the main part of this talk, which will be organized in, in three sections. There are four, but in fact, we have three. The first is about what is going on in the Amazonia as a threat to forests and to the people living uh, in them. The second part uh, will deal with the role of the forest people in protecting the forest, in protecting their worlds. Uh, and finally, the third part will take us back to the concept of the first schools and with to the related concept of uh, forest citizenship as an example of what Marietta has called the exercise of imagination by thinking about a sustainable human relationship with nature in the Anthropocene age. Okay, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about why it is necessary to set up schools of the, for of the forest. This is the problem, what is going on in Amazonia and with the forest. Uh, I have been working now for three decades in the state of Acre and elsewhere in Brazil, and uh, particularly in the area, in the westernmost most part of, uh, of Brazil, that's the state of Acre, at the frontier between Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru. This is the last, one of the last places in, in, the, in the Americas, and maybe in the world, where you can find still populations living in isolation from uh, uh, white people. These are uh, those isolated Indians, in fact, have been avoiding contact for say, 100 years with white people. 
And even with uh, so-called civilized Indians, and they obtain things like metal objects, knives, and machetes, etc., by stealing them, but avoid, avoiding completely direct contact. Okay, this is uh, the kind of project linking Acre with the green area in western Brazil to the Pacific Ocean. You can see two routes. And these routes, that's the, my point, goes directly through the territory where those Indians um, have hidden for so long. Uh, I show you uh, a brief anticipation of what is the effect of roads going through uh, an Amazonia territory. This is a simulation done by a team of scientists, Brazilian and uh, non-Brazilians, based on previous experiences uh, with uh, roads and road building in Amazonia. And this is more or less what's likely to happen. This is deforestation, it grows and it becomes like that. And then it takes over the whole territory uh, occupied by now by like 22 Indian groups and uh, which is also a place of one of the highest biological diversities in the world. Uh, I will briefly go through those maps. They are intended to show <coughs> the scale of the projects of timber exploitation, also oil, including shale, uh, gas, and uh, other activities, legal and illegal, which are uh, compressing the available the space where the ancient populations have lived to this day. Uh, and the yellow boundaries are supposed to show you where those Indian uh, groups uh, are hiding uh, now. That's precisely where the roads will be passing toward the Pacific Ocean and uh, why uh, the place is also where large number of concessions, mainly of timber and oil exploitation are being uh, issued recently. Well, this is, uh, it's, it's not only I'll go over it, the, this process, but I, I want only to mention that uh, deforestation which goes together with road construction, with hydroelectric dams, like in the Xingu River, and uh, with other uh, infrastructure projects in Amazonia have, are not the only effect of so-called development in this aggressive style which is going on uh, nowadays. You have also other kinds of loss of, no, of local diversity, and this is an example. Uh, which is the introduction of uh, transgenic seeds in the area through public action, uh, action and mainly uh, through trade posts, which are replacing the local diversity, the local agricultural diversity with the subject of research research that, that we are currently doing in Amazonia. Now, uh, who protects 
those forests. This map is showing advance of deforestation in Amazonia. And you can see that there is some void space in Pará, southern Pará, some areas uh, which are surrounded by deforestation. Deforestation is in purple. And the thing is, why? What's going, what, what, goes, what prevents soil plantations and the cattle ranches from going into those areas, those pockets of forest? This uh, explanation, in this, in this uh, particular area, you can see this pocket of forest surrounded by deforested areas. And this is precisely the territory in the, on the Xingu River of where live today Indians and also Brazilian descendants of Robert Tapper's caboclos, mixed blood people who have lived in the forest for a century now. And this is a recent example, in fact, of two weeks ago, of a flight over this territory where you can compare the indigenous lands with the plantation areas and see what's the effect of deforestation and uh, the active role of Indian populations in protecting their, their lands. Uh, the other point is that <coughs> this active role of uh, indigenous peoples in Amazonia in the protection of the nature, it's, it's not limited to avoiding deforestation. They, uh, and to illustrate this point, I would like to comment a little bit on, on, the, on the project from which uh, a number, uh, large number of researchers, in which uh, a large number of researchers are involved. And uh, which is, looks into the role of indigenous and, and the traditional peoples in generating and conserving biological diversity, and particularly agricultural biodiversity. This map shows a research site where experiments and observation in a cooperative way are being uh, done, bringing forth evidence about this activity by means of which indigenous groups produce new varieties of uh, plants. In particular, uh, those are two sites of study, one in North Amazonia, another one in Southern Amazonia. And I, I just would like to mention as an example of this uh, activity that uh, in North Amazonia, in the river, Rio Negro Basin, research carried out by Lor, one of our collaborators, and which is joint coordinator of this project, together with me, uh, in the River Negro alone, over 120 varieties of cassava have been uh, identified. Also, dozens of uh, varieties of pepper and several other agricultural products. And the point is that those ind indigenous uh, populations, uh, groups, are not just conserving for the future this variety of cultivated plants, but they are, in fact, developing those varieties under our eyes. It means that they should be 
In fact, in that uh, area, it's mainly the women who do this kind of development, for agricultural diversity, uh, moved by curiosity, by aesthetic interest, but not just by uh, concern with practical, immediate utility. And they should be considered as uh, a kind of scientific researchers side by side with people who work in official uh, institutions for agronomic development. Uh, cassava was, in fact, domesticated in South America in an area with uh, several researchers associated with the state of Acre and of Rondonia. But the point about uh, current research is that this process was not carried only in the past, but it's going on today. Uh, ooh, the, the interesting thing to notice is that, I, I, as I mentioned before, the real Negro women are not looking for practical uses for cassava varieties. This would not be a justification for having collections like museum collections containing dozens and over 100 different kinds of uh, the same species of cassava, for instance. One interesting thing is that this kind of uh, activity is associated with a particular view of the world, a view where plants are persons, just like you and me. So uh, real Negro women treat the cassava plants as women like themselves, endowed with qualities like uh, vanity, they like to be pampered, like if they were in a beauty parlor. That's how the Indians talk about them. They like music, they like company. So respecting traditional knowledge is not trying to convince indigenous uh, women that plants are not persons. It means not trying to make them cultivate cassava in regular patterns like specialist agronomists tell them to do. It means respecting their apparently disorganized way of planting, because it, when you see those gardens, they uh, look like a mess, a confusion of many kinds of plants without a clear order, without rows, without a square pattern, and so on. Treating them as partners in scientific research, contributing with their traditional knowledge it mean, means respecting their way of uh, viewing the world as the basis of partnership. We don't have to destroy the world in which plants and persons are human to and replace this world with our world where plants have not so. That's one of the principles who guide the University of the Forest. OK, uh, another point I'd like to mention is that uh, another example of the contribution of, in fact, what the forest have to teach, can teach to us, that's the title of, of this talk, uh, the example is 
uh, the concept of many indigenous groups in Amazonia that what we know about nature is largely taught to us by animals, by monkeys, by birds, and by other animals, which they consider as possessing science, a kind of knowledge, more deep in some aspects than the knowledge of human peoples, but which a kind of knowledge which is taught to, uh, to we humans. And an example of uh, this is uh, the, how indigenous populations in the state of Acre, particularly the Axininca and the Caxinawa, perceive climatic changes. Residents say that they can perceive sadness in the jungle associated with heat, increasing heat, irregularity of uh, seasons, unexpected uh, rising of the water, bad smell of the waters, and so on. It talk about many symptoms of disorder in the nature, which they say it's of recent or origin. Uh, and uh, one of, of the things that they say is, is that in the past, they used it to follow animals, the voices of birds, signs presented by frogs and so on, to forecast weather change, and, uh, season change, time to planting, and so on. And they say that today, the animals have stopped to act as guides to understanding climatic changes. Uh, to understanding changes in the weather, in the, the seasons, etc., because the animals themselves, birds and other animals, are getting increasingly confused by the disorder of the weather. So, uh, animals, birds, and others have to learn everything new they say, and this takes time. They have to learn everything new about uh, weather because the weather has changed so much that it became impredictable, impredictable for the animals. And for these reasons, the animals cannot keep teaching us about what's going on in the nature. They are confused, just like us. This is a subject with a former student of mine is researching for years in, in Western Acre, among the Ashaninka and the Kashinawa Indians. Forest populations is, uh, uh, also, are also a source of philosophical views about nature, about the world, and uh, they can contribute to our culture by introducing varieties of uh, different styles of thinking, particularly concerning the relationship between people, uh, humans and non-humans. An example of this is the idea of master of animals which is shared by almost all indigenous Indian populations and also by caboclo, mixed blood people all over Amazonia. Kaipora ethics, it's about hunting and it's about happiness and unhappiness. It tells that the hunter must respect the animal. Even when the animal is dead, you must respect the dead body of the animal. You must not insult 
it. Insultar is the word they use. If uh, you insult the animal by treating him or her in a disrespectful way, you become uh, unhappy. Unhappy in love, in unhappy in, as a hunter. So you must not abuse of luck. You must share everything you hunt from the forest. You cannot sell uh, gain, obtain it from the forest. You must not hunt in days where the Kaipora is taking care of his people, his family, where he is curing the animals, and so on. Uh, this is an example among several other kinds of thinking that you find among those, these populations. I would like very briefly to show some examples also of technical and uh, artistic contributions of indigenous peoples in the Acre area. And you notice I am restricting, restricting my focus in Acre, and the Acre is a tiny part of Amazonia. Amazonia is a much wider array and contains hundreds of similar examples of cultural originality, techno, technical knowledge. This is uh, the kind of uh, waving done by Kashinawa women. They are called kene, and each kene has, of course, a, a meaning uh, which I want to try to uh, go into now. Uh, and the kene were given, bestowed to these women by mythic ancestors long time ago. And they preserve this technique and this knowledge about their history. Those are examples of, of Kene art. You see, uh, the, the, those patterns have aesthetical, aesthetical value, and I like to think about them also as an example of mathematical ability uh, of Kashinawa women. And this is a sample of how kene is applied to the human body, not only in waving the patterns. Uh, I will pass this is, I, I will not comment on this, but this is a rep representation of cosmological uh, relations, which you can f find among the Kashinawa. In fact, these figures, including eight different points, red and, and black, and uh, the thing is that the whole world for the Kashinawa, including people, animals, plants, and uh, stars is classified in these eight categories, in these eight classes. And together, they are complementary in a number of ways, including, in the case of persons, really kinship relations. So the whole world, natural, non-natural, cosmic, and vegetal, is part of same overall pattern that you can see in the way they grow gardens, in the way they wave the clothes, and so on. And now I finish with the idea of the uh, schools of the forest, which is uh, a way of recognizing this creativity, artistic, scientific, technical, of the uh, uh, people of the forest, and trying to make uh, a bridge between scientific community and uh, traditional knowledge as a tool to protect, to defend the forest territories and its inhabitants, again, human and non-human. So I am not pessimistic about the future of Amazonian forests, despite 
the initial picture of destruction and of uh, associated with uh, economic and political interests. Uh, my source of optimism is precisely the feeling of respect for the power of indigenous, of local initiatives, creativity, and their competence to make a difference in what's going on. Uh, this is uh, an image of a project carried out by uh, my wife Manuela and, and me. By the same time, when they emerged the idea of the University of the Forest. You see that the place is precisely located where the planet road is going to cross Amazonia. And it is near, therefore, a center of highest biological and cultural diversity. And the, the idea was set up this experiment in this area precisely to try to find answers to the challenge of this huge intrusion of new people, migrants, oil, shale gas exploitation, which has very recently been bestowed to a private company this year in, in, in the area. The idea was to find answer to this challenge in a cooperative way, together with the local population, but taking to the place the best scientific competence available to establish a creative, creative collaboration with local populations. And also opening the doors of these centers of production of knowledge to young people irrespective of previous educational background of social class and so on. So it was meant to be uh, a combination of science technology with respect for traditional knowledge, treating faculty and engines and rubber toppers as equals having the Amazonia and its problems as a research focus, located in many places, in towns, rivers, and forests. Rivers, like in boats, like floating itinerant schools, and protecting intellectual rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. The initial campus would be in Cruzeiro do Sul, Acre, it's again, it's, uh, this is part, this slide is part of older presentation when we, we were trying to convince Brazilian authorities with success, in fact, to support this project in a very remote area where nobody was thinking about investing much resources in, in this kind of education join local community scientific research, basic education, and a research institution that was the Institute of Biodiversity, aiming social integration and forest conservation. Uh, this is to show you how the, the concept of universal forest should include several local centers dispersed across the whole uh, state of Acre. If you want several small campi spread uh, along the rivers, forests, and, and towns, and base it on previous initiatives, really. Uh, I want to conclude this talk 
by mentioning an example now of uh, what Ma Maria Chisa described it as exercises of imagination associated with this idea of uh, schools of the forest. Uh, but before that, let me add something. You can ask me, okay, this was project of 2005. What happened to the project? Well, the government has actually invested a considerable amount of money in infrastructure and in hiring a faculty, about 100 teachers, many of them uh, with uh, doctorate degrees, which is very hard to imagine in such remote place, but they were attracted by the vision, let's say that. There is uh, the, the building, the installations, the money, etc. But the original concept was perhaps premature because it tried to change simultaneously two main institutions under uh, official structure. It would have included high school, college, and research, advanced research in an integrated way. That, that was very hard to do. It didn't happen that way. You can go visit today the campus of the forest. And we, are, we are proud to have contributed to this center of higher education in Acre. But it's not the space of equality of styles, or knowledge styles, which we have uh, dreamed of. It's, it became a conventional university with a section for teaching future uh, teaching engines to be professor, uh, primary school teachers, agricultural and forestry agents, and so on. So in this campus, the present day campus, indigenous activities are like segregated from the other ones. It helps to give superior, higher education at the college level to future Indian teachers and future Indian agents of uh, agroforestry and development projects. And in this sense, it is uh, having good results. But uh, the thing is that uh, I could give several instances of research being done by uh, young Indians at this campus about topics like the symbolic uh, and practical organization of agriculture. The Hunikuin Indians accompany all phases of agricultural activities with uh, songs appropriate to each uh, variety of plant. And this means how those students are integrating their technical uh, learning, what they are learning from agroforestry in the university with their traditional cultural cosmological background. They are doing research about their ancestors, doing biographies about the uh, elderly women. They are looking into the waving techniques of the uh, indigenous. This uh, covers uh, many, many indigenous uh, groups, the Marubo, the Kashinawa, the Katukina, and uh, many others. Uh, but the point is that today, the real implementation of the concept of the schools of the forest is the multiplication of places in different areas of Brazil, central Brazil, coastal Atlantic areas, and uh, Amazonia, places where uh, separate experiments, separate but interlinked experiments are being done in along the original idea, which 
I, which I repeat, was not uh, isolated creation of ours, but it was a simultaneous initial uh, appearance, emergence of efforts to integrate <coughs> Indian traditional, indigenous traditional knowledge into Western ways of doing science. So uh, uh, subjects of discussion in the workshop planned for tomorrow is are the examples of such initiatives integrating indigenous knowledge and uh, scientists all over Brazil. So in this sense, the concept is alive and well. And finally, uh, talk about imagination. Quoting Marietta, the broader goal is to construct the imaginary of a sustainable human relationship with nature in the Anthropocene age. Well, that's what indigenous populations, Amerindians in uh, uh, South America and elsewhere have been doing for a long time. Uh, but I am giving now an example from a town, from the Acre capital, Rio Branco, not from indigenous thought, but from intellectuals in, in the urban scene of uh, the state of Acre, and particularly quoting the notion of uh, Florestania. Florestania can be translated as the Ciudadania del Bosque, forest citizenship, and means that uh, it's an idea that appears in several parts of the world and in several indigenous groups of Amazonia. But in this case, forestania means that the planet's subjects are, are by right and in fact uh, the planet's subjects are the peoples and animals which live in the forest. It includes the generations to come, the animals, the trees, the light, the water, and even the stones. I quote, I translate from Antonio Alves, a philosopher living in Rio Branco, Acre. The florestania, forest citizenship, means that you must enlarge our ideas of a democracy. Particularly, it includes the notion of votes for the, those yet unborn. Paying attention to the voice, unheard but virtual voice of those who cannot speak, so that their silence will not be mistaken with agreement. But how can you talk about non-human participation in the process of public choices? How can the mute can be heard? Uh, Antonio Alves says that uh, you must pay attention when agricultural policies are contested by weather changes, when there is no rain, or by delay in the flowering of trees, or by uh, in unexpected animal migration, or by the fishes who decided not to run up a river, as in protest against the river pollution and bad smell uh, as it, it's happening now, or by the disappearance of bees, or because or when too many hunters come back home unlucky and there is no food from the forest for holding feasts and meetings. So this, uh, it means 
that the forest banks have a voice if you are prepared to expose it to hear to it. And with this, I conclude, and thank you very much.